to uh, Tony Sinceri for some comments. All right, thank you, Brandon. So I'll make sure, can you guys hear me? Yes, sir, coming in loud and clear. Perfect, thank you much. Well, I first want to just welcome everybody to the August installment of our of our state technical advisory committee. Uh, thank you all for participating. We've had a we've had quite a year so far. Uh, we're we're actually closing in on the end of our fiscal year right now, and our field offices are are busy wrapping up Equip, our our CSP program, and then also really working hard on CRP across the state. Uh, we're still we're down to about six weeks left to wrap up this all these different programs and uh, we've actually been given the opportunity to to uh, receive a, a little bit more funding here at the end of the year and our field offices have, have graciously taken on the opportunity to to get a few more dollars obligated out to our our producers across the across the state so i i really want to start off by just saying how much I appreciate how hard the NRCS staff across the state are working to get our programs implemented and working to to get our, our producers needs met and helping helping our producers to remain sustainable across the state. We do have a, a number of of items that have come up recently that we are uh, working through. Uh, one of the items that has just recently come up is the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. This is a, an act that has just made it, uh, I, think, I think the president just signed this just the other day. Uh, the discussion that's coming down through the agency regarding this act is there, there's going to be an increase in funding or a potential significant increase in funding for, for NRCS. Uh, they're looking at having a, an increased start in fiscal year 23 with a, with a even bigger increase come fiscal year 24. So we're going to be looking at this over the next couple of years as a pretty significant increase. And we've been asked to start coming up with a plan on with an increase in funding. What are we going to do with this funding across the state? So we're going to have some op more opportunities as we look at fiscal year 23 and 24 to get even more conservation into South Dakota. With uh, this, uh, so this, this I'm starting to hear an echo. Um, um, so this year we did obligate close to 20 to 22 million dollars under our equip program for our CSP program close to 20 million dollars if not a little bit more um, I think Brandon you're on this a little bit later so you can correct me if I'm if I'm incorrect on the amounts that we've spent up to this point uh, we are and I, I've mentioned this at our last our, our last state tech meeting uh, so conservation implementation strategy this is this is how South Dakota is moving forward at this point with obligating our, our equip funding. Uh, really, what we're asking for, and especially with all the partners on the phone right now, this this is a big opportunity for for all of you to work with NRCS. Uh, most of you have a good understanding of of how NRCS spends money through our equip and CSP programs, and this is an opportunity that if you have projects out there, if you're already working in watersheds, if you're already working with partners and you have a project that could potentially pair with what NRCS does, come talk to us. Bring bring those proposals, bring those projects in. Let's visit with our district conservationists and see if we can't find a way to get our programs to work together because we have that opportunity. And let's 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 leverage each other's funding to to help our conservation dollar go a little bit further here in South Dakota. But we're definitely open for the conversation. If you have projects out there, we want to hear about them. We want to hear what's going on. We want to hear what you guys are working on and seeing if there's ways that NRCS can work with you. There were a couple of other items that just recently came out. One is we had an announcement um, that came out last week, and it's the Grazing Lands Conservation Initiative. Uh, there's uh, about 12, 12 million dollars that's up for grabs right now. Um, and this is for funding for partners to uh, work towards grazing land education and graze, grazing land projects. Uh, so there is a notice of funding that's currently out. Uh, if you'd like more information on GLCI or that funding, please reach out to Colette Kessler. Uh, she has a lot of that information. We're trying to get more information right now, but if you do have more specific questions regarding that opportunity, please reach out to Colette. Uh, also, we had our um, our RCPP uh, 
program uh, award announcement went out earlier this week. So congratulations to the partners within South Dakota that received a RCPP uh, award. So that, that's a lot of work that goes into that. And I'm really happy to see that we had a couple that came into South Dakota. The last item I just wanted to mention before handing this over is we are still across the state working through uh, operations with, with COVID. We still are weekly on Fridays, we end up getting a bulletin uh, that gets sent out to the entire state uh, saying what, we're, what, what our restrictions are for, for the week. And that could be either reduced staffing in an office or if there's a mask requirement uh, and we have to respond according to what um, that policy that's coming out each week. There is some new policy that's just came out from the CDC that we're still working through uh, as far as what our responses are moving forward. Uh, but we're still we're still trying to figure that out because it, it just came out. But uh, we are still working on, on remaining fully staffed in our offices to the best of our ability, but it, there are still some uh, complications with that. And that's one of the reasons that we're not meeting in person this week. I was really hoping that that with Dakota Fest going on, we'd all have an opportunity to meet in Mitchell and actually have this meeting in person. But with uh, with COVID, it, it, we were getting close and we were concerned that at the last minute this county could pop up or or Mitchell would pop up on the list as a county that we couldn't all get together and we'd have to cancel. So we just decided to do it remotely. So I do appreciate everybody's flexibility and I'm really hoping that as we move into our next meeting that we will actually be able to start talking about having some more face-to-face -face meetings or at least hybrid meetings. So again, I want to say thank you to to all of you for participating in this meeting today. Um, I'll be kind of in and out of this meeting. I am planning on going and listening to um, one of the roundtable discussions at Dakota Fest regarding the Farm Bill. Uh, but I, I want to stick around in here if anybody has questions or if there's any discussion items. So uh, I guess Brandon, before I turn it back to you, does does anybody have any questions for me right off right off the the top here? Well, if you do have, if you end up having any questions, don't hesitate to drop a question in the chat or just um, ask it at a different point. Like I said, I'll be I'll be here for a bit. So, Brandon, I'll I'll turn this back over to you for now. All right, thank you very much, Tony. Um, next up on the agenda uh, is congressional updates. Uh, do we have any of the congressional representatives with today that uh, would like to present or provide us an update? All right, I guess it looks like at this point we're not seeing any. If they should join us here, we can uh, circle back. So uh, next we can move on to FSA updates. Uh, I'm going to believe Brandon Walter going to be on for us today here, giving us an update on CRP. Yeah, good morning, everybody. I'm Brandon Walter, and I'm the state biologist here in Huron, and I also uh, have the responsibility as the CRP program manager on the N NRCS side. Um, Jessica's on leave today, so she asked that, as well as Owen uh, Fagerhog, who normally gives the CRP update. Uh, so I was asked to fill in and just provide a a couple of uh, key points and a little bit of information on what we got going on with CRP and, and how the workload looks. Uh, so I provided Kathy and she sent it out with the with the uh, invite to join some information, a spreadsheet that kind of breaks down the information and workload by resource unit, as well as a notice. And I'll just go ahead and share my screen. I have a couple things I'd just like to point out um, and kind of give everybody a little more insight into what that spreadsheet actually says. So. All right, does everybody see my screen? Brandon, is it coming through? Yeah, it is coming through online. OK, I just wanted to share uh, notice CRP 979, which FSA uh, sent out on the 3rd of August. And it's just kind of an update on the timelines that we have for completing conservation plans. Uh, so basically, 
you know, NRCS and FSA work hand in hand with CRP. It is an FSA program. However, NRCS provides the technical assistance, writes the conservation plans and provides all the information that uh, participants need uh, to get the particular practice, CRP practice on the ground, whether that be a grass seeding, uh, trees, waterways, whatever it might be. Um, but we do have certain timelines that we have to meet uh, with completing conservation plans so that um, these uh, offers, I guess, can be accepted into contract. Uh, so, so this table here uh, just kind of shows in the, in the first part here is for all the signups. Uh, when a partic participant comes into FSA uh, and signs up uh, that they're interested in CRP, uh, within five working days, FSA will provide that information. Uh, over to us so that we can uh, begin work in the process that we need in order to complete uh, conservation plans. The general CRP sign up, which I know Owen gave a little report last, uh, I think the last uh, state tech on kind of the pro uh, the progress on that, but the majority of that workload is done um, for the most part. Uh, we had to have our conservations completed, as you can see, on the 29th of July. And pretty much all that work got done. Uh, there are some that we'll see on the spreadsheet uh, that are still showing submitted for for plan. Uh, but in most all of them cases, I believe I actually believe all the cases, uh, the participants either you know said they weren't interested anymore or or were, we were unable to get a hold of them to to complete any of the planning and, and complete the conservation plan. Continuous sign up. Uh, 57, you'll see we have a date no later than September 9th, and that's a little bit misleading, but what that is for is for any re-enrollments, uh, any re-enrollments into continuous CRP, uh, as well as the Clear 30, uh, our grassland CRP, all have to be completed by September 9th. Uh, so NRCS will have all the conservation plans signed by the produce, producer, all the documents done and, and returned back to FSA so that they can get them approved by county committee and get them uh, through the process uh, before the end of the fiscal year because uh, re-enrollments, grasslands, clear 30, all of them have to be done uh, before the beginning of the new fiscal year on October 1. Other continuous, if it's a new offer, obviously um, whether they're doing trees or you know working on a wetland practice on a new offer, there could potentially be crops out in the field. So basically on if somebody has a new offer, we may you know, push that back till November 1 or December 1 as a start date. Uh, all all continuous offers start on the first of the month um, after it's been approved. So if it gets approved on December 2nd, for instance, it'll start January 1st. Um, so that's kind of how continuous CRP works. I just wanted to cover that on the notice. We do have a little bit of an extension on, on as you can see here through this notice on the general CRP 58. Uh, we had a deadline to complete plans by the 29th, but on a case by case basis, the state executive director um, does have uh, the authority to authorize an extension up till this Friday, basically. Um, but I don't believe we have any that we need to do that on. I'll go ahead and stop sharing that. And then I'll bring up. The spreadsheet that I'd like to. Just kind of go over. Um, is that coming through, Brandon? Uh, we're seeing your team's page at the moment. OK. Hope it's working anyway. Let me stop and reshare. Does that look better? It's currently thinking. OK. It says on my end it's presenting, but. That's still black on our end. Might be a pretty big document or something that you're looking at. OK, I'll shut off my camera. Maybe that'll help. I don't know. Nothing yet.
I don't know what's going on. Should share. Okay. There we go. Does it come up? Oh, okay. It. All right. Um, okay. This this is a spreadsheet that we that I put together, and it breaks down our CRP workload by resource unit. Um, Don Byers with FSA pulls the the actual report from their system, uh, which breaks it down by county, which is basically the same information. However, I I go ahead and put it into a a spreadsheet like this by our resource units for our assistants out in the field, uh, Tate, Michelle, and now Matt out in Pierce, so that they can, you know, take a look at the workload and see, you know, where they have some hot spots in the different signups. And you'll see at the bottom, we have all the signups, whether it be continuous, the CCRP, which is showing now, uh, we have the CREP, the Clear 30, our farmed wetlands, uh, our highly erodible land, CRP, our safe offers, general grasslands, and then we we had ship the last couple of years, but we didn't have a sign up this year for that. But just to kind of give you an idea of what we have, you know, we have the columns completed, submitted, submitted to NRCS for the plan, submitted to COC, and then approved. And basically on the NRCS side, we're most concerned about this uh, column B here, the submitted for plan. Uh, which basically means, and there's a legend down below that uh, if it's been submitted to plan, that means the offers uh, information has been referred to NRCS for the planning and complete the plan. Um, the completed column is just basically anybody that comes in. Uh, some of them might just be kicking tires on CRP to begin with, so they may not go anywhere. If it has been submitted, that means that the participant has actually signed uh, and wants to move forward. And then again, the submitted for plan is sitting within RCS to complete the plans. And then once we complete the plans, the numbers will move over. As you can, you can kind of gather, we'll go to submit to the county committee so that they can go over them and approve them and sign them. And then once they sign, then it slips over here to the COC approved, um, which actually reflects the offers that have been processed. So I'll just kind of quick go through the numbers. You can see we had quite a few approved already through continuous, but we have a lot yet still sitting there. And some of them may be re-enrollments, which need to be processed, I guess, first. Uh, but a lot of them might be new offers that we might not uh, worry about getting to them uh, until maybe even November, December, January, something like that, depending on crops and, and timelines. So, And then you'll see the CREP, which is our uh, reserve enhancement program. Uh, with game fish and park or FSAs with game fish and parks. Uh, but you'll see we have 114 of them submitted for plan. We've completed 115. Uh, Clear 30, which is our 30 year, I guess you call it easement CRP, uh, which are basically re enrollments. Uh, we've completed 15 of them. Uh, we have six of them yet to get done and they need to be done, uh, like I showed in the notice by uh, September 9th. FWPs again, highly erodible. We don't have any of them. Safe, which is our, our pheasant safe and our West River safe. It's all combined on on this uh, document for for our purposes for workload. But you can see through these numbers, you know, here we got the total numbers. But as you page through here, you can see which counties and which resource units have the majority of the work. Uh, when you start looking through that. General CRP, which I know Owen went over the acres uh, the last time he gave a report. Uh, this is just going to show the numbers. Uh, these were this uh, this along with grasslands going to have another column, which is going to be what they we call the accepted column. So we may have had uh, we had quite a few more offers than were accepted, but the 132 number is the total uh, number of offers. Uh, and I know Owen gave the number of acres last time, but you'll see kind of where the majority of the offers for general CRP are at. Uh, Lyman has 20 and 22 and Stanley. Uh, but most of that works all done. There's still 13 that sit in this column. But like I said, uh, they're either producers didn't respond uh, to inquiries or decided they didn't want to go ahead. Grasslands, we're just getting started with that. Uh, we had a 1,301 of them offers accepted. Uh, 
and we have 1,253 that are submitted over for plan. And this report is of last week. We'll we'll be working on another uh, report this week. So I'm I'm assuming these numbers are going to start shifting as people start getting uh, planners start getting the work done. Uh, so I guess that's basically the reports that I just wanted to go through just to show the workload. Um, Grassland CRP is going to be hitting our planners pretty hard, and to try to get uh, plans knocked out here by the 9th of September. So. If we have any questions, I'll, you know, I'll do the best I can to answer them. Uh, some of them might be more Owen orientated, but if there are some with our planners, I'll, I'll sure do the best I can. All right, I'm not seeing any questions in the chat for Brandon, so thank you very much, Brandon, for that update on CRP and everything that you do working on CRP. We greatly appreciate it. So uh, the next item on the agenda is our soil health update. Uh, so we're going to turn it over to Kent Flieger for a little presentation. OK, good morning, everyone. Um, so yeah, today we're going to start a, a new series on soil organic matter. Um, for those of you that have been uh, regular attenders of the state technical technical committee meeting, um, last meeting we wrapped up our, our no till doesn't work series, which was basically a, a series on our five principles of soil health and um, just kind of the importance of them and what each principle is and and really just some of the some of the basics so we all have the same understanding. And I'm going to share my screen with you all here and I'll turn my camera off to save bandwidth. We can see it again. OK, is it coming through? Yes, looks good. OK, good. OK, so we're going to talk about soil organic matter. Um, this series is going to uh, kind of be probably a three or four part series and how it's going to be broken down is uh, today we're going to talk about uh, really what soil organic matter is. So we're all on the same page as far as its various forms and and um, really just what it is when it's in the soil. Um, and then the next couple of meetings, we'll talk about um, how we lose soil organic matter in our production systems um, and how we can build soil organic matter in our production systems. And then some of the, the various practices and methods that we can we can look at improving upon or adopting in order to do that. So. Yeah, soil organic matter is the first in the series today, and it's basically the basics. And so, um, you know, that as often as the case with uh, some of our comics that we read in the newspaper and online, there's a little bit of truth behind behind the humor in it. And so this is just a really good one. Um, basically, two cows are joking about how their their cow pies feed the soil and their soil feeds the grass and the grass feeds them. So really, it's just kind of a, a comics way of explaining the, the, the carbon cycle, really. So just a fresh uh, remember for every a reminder for everyone. These are our principles of soil health, and if we break it down into really two categories for the five principles. Um, the first is one that we as NRCS have been doing for a long time, and that's the the protection of the soil, and that's minimizing our disturbance and maximizing soil cover. Um, so we know how to do that. Uh, know how to do that pretty well. Um, and the other side of the equation is is the feed the soil, and this is where kind of the trend is today with with soil health systems and regenerative agriculture. And so that's maximizing our living roots, maximizing our biodiversity and then integrating a livestock into our into our systems. OK, so um, I apologize for the for the flow chart. I know a lot of you are probably thinking uh, I don't want to come to a high school biology class today, but um, when it comes to soil organic matter, this this flow chart really does a good job of explaining um, what uh, what in fact it is and so really it it breaks it down into two categories we'll start at the top with soil organic matter and then the next line down goes into two categories and those categories are labile organic matter and uh, humus so um, the best way to think about those two categories is one is really active soil organic matter and the other one is really stable uh, which would be the hummus uh, the humus is the really stable 
and not as active in the soil. And so we're going to go through each one of these today and we're going to start with the labile organic matter, which is really the, the active portion of, of the soil organic matter profile. OK, so um, this is just uh, the first first group here. We've got soil organic matter labile, which labile really kind of means it's it's active. It's readily turned over. Um, it's just kind of the, the terminology that we use, and it's broken down into four categories underneath the labile uh, fraction or the active fraction. And so the first one is, is biomass, and that's the living living organisms. So that uh, consists of you know of all the things that you think of that might be alive that are in the soil, including um, plant roots and plants and roots themselves. So here's the biomass um, uh, slide that I use and. I've, I've got an area circled here and it's it might be small on your screen, but really what you're looking at in that circle is you'll see a very fine and thin, almost translucent, uh, uh, looks like a little worm that's kind of to the to the left of that um, darker mass there, and that's a nematode. And uh, nematodes are something that are really found quite readily in, in healthy soils and higher organic matter soils. Um, and for the most part, a vast majority of them are really beneficial to our soils. Um, oftentimes we as uh, especially uh, agronomists or producers think of nematodes as pests, but a vast majority of them are predators and, and beneficials in our, in our soil profile. So that's one example of, of living biomass that's in our soils. Um, this next one is, is really the, the plant fraction of the living biomass in the soils. And so what you're looking at here is is really a zoomed in um, photo from a micro microscope shot and the larger um, white rope looking structures that you're seeing there that's a really fine root hair from a grass plant and then if you'll see this area that i've circled there you'll notice an even finer hair that's coming off attached to that fine root hair of the grass plant and that right there is actually mycorrhizal fungi um, which a lot of us will we we'll recognize that name as being very important to the overall health of our of our prairie soil systems, and we'll talk in detail about mycorrhizal fungi in in a later part of the series. And I also like to point out the the aggregate that's attached to the to the plant root itself there, and really our aggregates that form in our soils are really only formed through the through the activity of of our soil organic matter and our soil life, and we'll talk in detail about those as as these meetings progress here through the quarters. OK, the next part of our labile organic matter, our active organic matter is, is the detritus. And really, that's the it's the dead material that's that's in our soils. And it's basically something that has has died recently and you can still identify um, what it used to be when it was alive. And so a good example of that is what we're seeing here in this photo is all the, the plant residue from the previous year. And so you can still identify the, the wheat straw or the corn uh, stalks or some of the leaves, for example. And so it's really that, that first stage of something that used to be alive and is, is now dead. All right, the next par portion of the, the label organic matter or the active portion is uh, particular organic matter. And so this is that kind of the next stage after it was recently died and now it has been broken down a little bit. This is where it starts to be really quite small. You can just kind of barely see um, what it is in the soil with, with the naked eye. And oftentimes it's broken down too small for you to see without a microscope or a magnifying glass. But this is a really active and really um, available part of the soil organic matter profile that makes our, uh, makes our soils really quite uh, nutrient dense. And this is what provides a lot of the the requirements for plant growth, so N, P, and K, and our micronutri micronutrients also. Okay, and then we're breaking down even further, and so now we're down into the byproducts and the wastes of of the living critters that are in the soil. And so this would be things like uh, root exudates, uh, bacterial waste, glomalin, uh, which is the byproduct produced by the mycorrhizal fungi. And so this stuff is really readily available. And if you look at the graphic um, I've got here, I've got you know little syringes kind of coming out of things that are representing uh, plant roots and bacteria and, uh, and the fungi. Um, think of this portion as really, it's almost kind of like a quick injection. It's really ready, readily available. 
Um, if you would think about like your like an IV for for a human, it's something that goes right into the system and is easily used um, by by the living parts uh, of the soil. OK, our next category. So we've, we've talked about the active portion, and that's something that's really easy for us to to identify. Maybe think about, you know, all the life that's in the soil. And so the next portion is the humus, and it's really kind of a really an older word for basically the stable fraction of, of the soil. And really, this is the part of the soil organic matter that is really highest, especially in our prairie soils. And so uh, 10 to 20 percent of our soils is consists of that active portion that we just talked about and the remaining portion. Um, so that 80 percent um, plus sometimes is really the the act or the stable portion. That's really why our soils are so um, inherently productive and fertile in the in the northern plains here in the in the prairie systems. And so this is that part of the soil that is. It's it's so stable really that it can hang around for for decades and centuries and sometimes millennia and it's there's nothing necessarily special or different about it than some of those last categories we talked about with the active. It's a lot of the particular organic matter um, broken down really small and then it's the the protected portion. Of those of those molecules or the carbon and organic matter and so what happens is that as the soil organic matter constantly is broken down and broken down and broken down, um, what happens is that it tends to latch on to pieces of the silt and clay and really kind of stains the surface of them and becomes difficult for soil life to to access it. And so it becomes really stable and available, um, really stable and not easily broken down, um, but it's still able to provide and to really hold on to nutrients that uh, then become later later available. Um, OK, so the last one that we don't uh, necessarily think a, a whole lot about here, or maybe we uh, should think more about it, actually, I should say, is is the char. And, you know, if you're kind of in tune or you keep track of a lot of what's going on in the soil health world, you hear a lot of talk about biochar, um, especially as you kind of move to higher populated areas or forested areas, and they talk about the benefits of using that as a soil amendment. Um, we here in the in the northern plains um, with our with our prairie systems. Um, burning on a regular basis, um, you know, prior to, to Europeans coming over, um, a large fraction of our soil organic uh, matter portion in the soil, or the soil organic carbon in the soil um, came from char and that's from the regular burning of, of the prairie system. And so when there was a fire that rolled through the prairie, one to one to three percent of what was burned of that biomass that was burned turned into char. So that's well, it's not very much um, over the decades and centuries and millennia. It, it kind of added up. And so there are estimates that, um, for example, in forest systems, um, five to ten percent of the soil organic carbon, that really stable part of the soil um, organic matter, is is coming from char. And so that seems like a lot in a forest system, um, but actually what uh, uh, some research, research has found is that in our prairie systems, 40 to 50% of uh, the stable portion, the humus of our soils is coming from char. And so what happens is that char is really stable, um, not necessarily quickly available for plant, or plant life or soil biology to digest. And so it becomes part of the soil and just forms really great uh, helps form really great aggregates, helps to uh, contribute to the nutrient availability in our soils also. So that is a quick, um, just kind of a quick lesson on what soil organic matter is and kind of how we break it down into the stable and the active portions within the soil. Um, next in the series, we're gonna talk about how we lose and how we lose soil organic matter. Um, over time and how it can happen a little more rapidly than we might be comfortable with. And then um, also we're going to discuss how we can start building that back into into our systems. So with that, I will open up to any questions as always. Um, if you think of a question at a later date, you can always shoot me an email or give me a call with my contact information there on the screen. So with that, I will turn it back to you, Brandon. 
All right, thank you very much, Kim, for that great presentation. Um, next on the agenda, we're going to move to uh, grants and agreements uh, with Colette. Good morning, everyone. So um, this year, NRCS South Dakota had a conservation collaboration cooperative agreement notice of funding last winter. Um, we ended up having, uh, we, we thought we would have more funding than we actually received. So we weren't able to go down the list very far uh, for agreements this year, but hopefully in the future, things will be looking up for as far as our collaborative um, cooperative agreements. Um, so we're still working through those with the grants and agreements team um, and haven't gotten things finalized yet for this part of the fiscal year. So yeah, I know we're <laughs> it's coming to the end of the fiscal year, so um, it'll be okay. But um, so uh, Tony had mentioned a couple of things in his opening comments that I just would like to reinforce. And one of them is the um, Raising Lands Conservation Initiative uh, grants opportunity. So I had dropped the link in the chat while he was speaking. And I think that's a wonderful opportunity for organizations to be doing some outreach or educational or with providing assistance for our South Dakota grasslands. So it is uh, half of our resource of the state and there's much opportunity to keep it healthy and productive. If you have any questions, um, I did speak with the grants manager the other day. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to help you facilitate uh, those that application. Um, another national opportunity is the uh, Conservation Innovation Grants, a CIG, that is on um, grants.gov right now. So if you go to www.grants.gov, you can do a search for NRCS and it'll list out all the uh, opportunities right there. So um, the CIG is a really great opportunity to um, do some uh, testing of practices. So we have our field office technical guide, our tried and true practices that the offices use when they're working with farmers and ranchers. Um, but there could be some new things out there in the landscape. There could be some things that uh, people are, are trying and that might be helping their operation that aren't necessarily in our technical guide, which is what we use for our conservation planning and our farm bill programs. So, if you've got some ideas of something, then this national CIG is certainly an opportunity to apply for that and get those tested. And maybe it could become um, an interim standard that can go in our, our tech guide. So just I wanted to make you aware of that opportunity because um, by no means are we the only source of information. And there's lots of people out there who are doing really exciting things in landscape. And just like Kent was showing in his presentation, there's this so much exciting things happening in the world of science and soils and, and, and agriculture. Um, then also, I guess the, the last thing I wanted to bring up is um, the conservation implementation strategy that Tony had mentioned. So there's opportunities across the state for doing more planning and with the local offices. And um, please, please, if you've got ideas, talk to the DCs or talk to the resource unit conservationists and I can help you get connected with them. Um, and if, uh, if there's introductions that need to be made, then we can certainly facilitate that too. So there, there's so many opportunities for doing conservation work. The hardest part is just focusing in on what resource concern to get started with. So, all right. Um, if anybody has any questions, I'll put my uh, phone number and email in the chat. Otherwise, uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Great, thank you very much, Cliff. Appreciate that. Uh, next up on the agenda uh, is the Comical Conservation Implementation Strategy. Uh, so I'm gonna give a little update on that. Um, this year, uh, we did uh, change up our process a little bit as far as we asked for some pre proposals on our projects. Uh, we did have 42 of those. Uh, from that pool, uh, after we reviewed them, we went back out and asked for a full proposal on 20 of those. Uh, we got back got back those uh, middle of the summer here. Uh, currently, uh, the leadership team uh, review panel is going through all those proposals and making our selections on which projects that we are going to be moving forward with. Um, I fully expect that by the end of next week, we'll have that finalized. Um, once it is, we'll get that update out to everyone to know uh, what we selected to deal with. Uh, but that's kind of where we sit at for this year uh, with those projects. A lot of good. Uh, 
products to choose from across all of South Dakota. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, as Tony and Clint had both mentioned, uh, we still are fully planning to move forward with CIAS again next year. Um, so as we continue to move into fiscal year 23, uh, we'll be getting out uh, the announcements on our website and everything uh, as we get those identified. Uh, we're not there yet, but it's getting closer. So we'll be sure to notify you guys when, when it is. I, I fully expect by our next state tech, we'll have a great update for you on the projects that we had selected for this year. Brandon? Yes, Clyde, yep. Um, I just want to interject here, if please forgive me. Um, yeah. did we, uh, maybe if you want to speak just a little bit about the pre-proposal process. That's one change that was made from the beginning to this year, of uh, the just the one page like pre-proposal for the CAS projects. You, you bet. So, you know, what she is being referencing there is, um, you know, it, it's a lot of work we understand for our partners and for our staff uh, putting in a full pre-proposal or a full proposal. Uh, so we could shorten that process down, um, cut significantly as much of the workload on it to just shorten it up to a brief uh, proposal of this is what our, our tentative project is. We're just kind of hoping to cut down on the workload for everybody. So try to make things a little bit easier. So that's kind of where we're at the pre-proposal and the full proposals were a little bit longer, about 10 to 12 pages of what they submitted everything to us for review. So. Um, all right, I guess that's what I briefly have for you on CIS. Um, next, we're going to move into the individual program updates. Um, first up, we do have uh, Krisha Letty. She currently is our acting RCPP coordinator. Uh, she started with us back in early June um, and has been doing a phenomenal job getting RCPP up and rolling in South Dakota. So we greatly appreciate her assistance there. So that's them. I'll turn it over to Krisha. All right, thanks, Brandon. Hi, everyone. My name is Krisha Letty, and uh, just to give you a little overview on RCPP in South Dakota, we currently have nine funded projects, and these are in various phases. There are six RCPP classics and three AFAs, which is the alternative funding arrangement. Um, and South Dakota is the lead for all of these projects. This accounts for 39 million for conservation funding. The newest one that was just announced on Friday is the conservation easements in the Black Hills of South Dakota, and it is sponsored by the South Dakota Agricultural Land Trust. The project was awarded 4.2 million and was one of 41 projects funded nationwide. This project will protect South Dakota farms and ranches so that the land remains agriculture and prevents it from being converted to the urban sprawl, which is happening presently in the Black Hills. I will begin work with the partner. I've got some training here the first part of September, and then we will be working on getting their programmatic agreement in through the portal. So um, that will be the first kind of crunch to do with, with them. Um, other projects that are actively being worked on in South Dakota include the Big Sioux River Watershed Partnership Project, and they have successfully contracted 26 producer contracts, and I've been very active in working, trying to get those obligated so that we can make some uh, payments out to the producers. Most of those projects were for doing cover crops and improving soil health. The other one that is um, gaining some traction is the Belfouche River Watershed Project. And they are currently in the process right now working with producers to get conservation contracts. The other one that is the only AFA that is um, currently up and running is the Ducks Unlimited project and that is to improve soil health and they currently have five applications for doing conservation cover and um, I'm working with them to kind of work through that system since it's kind of a different process. Um, so I just want to share that RCPP is a great way for the partners to leverage their dollars because it is a one-to-one -one match and last year 
the notice of funding proposals were announced in January with a deadline of mid April. So if any partners are interested in trying to leverage what they want to do with NRCS, they can reach out to me and I will help them through that process. So I don't have anything else if anyone has any questions. Great. Thank you very much, Bishan. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. All right, next up uh, is Equip uh, with Jennifer Works. Hi, right, good morning, everyone. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. OK, uh, I don't have a handout for you in the packet this morning because we are working on um, finalizing some numbers for the two point five million dollars that we just received late last week. And so when we get all said and done, um, we're going to have quite a few contracts on the ground, which is great news for South Dakota. Uh, we did have. See, 31 um, CIS projects this year that we we funded or that had funds available and producer contracts in. Uh, unfortunately, one of them. Um, didn't have had a little hiccup in it, so it didn't fund any actual contracts in there, but those funds got used elsewhere within the CIS projects. Uh, most of the new funding right now is going into the resource units, and I will get a summary of final numbers to you at the next state tech. I guess, is there any, any further questions? Uh, lots to come on the new fiscal year and moving forward with CIS as a at 100 percent. All right, thank you very much, Jen. Appreciate the update. Right. Thank you. Uh, next up, uh, CSP with Joyce. Good morning. I'll give you a quick update. You do have this report in your um, folder, but I will share my screen with you and run through it quickly. Give an update on the 2022 CSP. Are you seeing my screen, Brandon? Yep, we are right now. Oh, good. Okay. So basically, just a quick reminder that we're getting, as we've already heard this morning, we're getting to the end of the fiscal year. So we're looking at payments for CSP. They are made after the first of the next fiscal year for the previous fiscal year. So October 1st is coming right up. So the documentation is due to the field offices. And so they're working hard on getting that done. And this for the roundup of what's happened this last few months anyway for the CSP classic, which our application deadline was January 21st this past winter. We did receive 523 applications. There has actually been several allocations made separate allocations made. We had an initial South Dakota had an initial allocation of 8.64 million and with that those monies we funded 57 contracts and we had a second allocation on May 9th we received that was four million four thousand dollars and with that we funded 19 more contracts our third allocation what came in early July was two million seven hundred eighty two thousand three hundred dollars we funded seven contracts and this next bullet is incorrect we actually just got our fourth allocation a small allocation this past week. And originally we had asked for the 2.168 million, but we received 1.350 million. And so it looks like we're going to fund probably five more contracts with that last allocation. So that um, my total, of course, would be wrong on both the, the funds and the number of contracts, but in, with just the exception of probably two or three contracts. So 
Um, we've kind of had a piecemeal bunch of allocations this year, but we're glad for each bit. We've had um, 1.2 million of these funds have been spent on beginning farmer applicants and 1.03 million went to socially disadvantaged applicants. So our obligation deadline for all of these monies will be September 15th. So the CSP renewals, um, we had an out, uh, application deadline of April 15th, and we did receive 333 applications. We do not know our allocation on amount on that, and we won't know it probably till after October 1st. And the obligation deadline on those has previously been September, I mean, pardon me, December 30th. So it'll probably be December 30th, 2022 for the obligation deadline. And until after the fiscal year, we won't know too much more on that on the renewals. And I don't know, haven't heard anything on GCI yet. I had understood that we would have another sign up, but so far I have not heard anything on that. So still waiting for news for GCI, C CSP GCIs. So if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat or le let me know. That pretty well wraps up CSP for 2022. Great. Thank you very much, George. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, Thank you. Next, next program on the list would be uh, easements with Marcus Rock. Morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. All right. Uh, I'll just give a, a brief update where we're at uh, and for our 2022 easement programs. Uh, this is also in the handouts as well, uh, so you can refer back to that. Uh, just go over uh, a handful of numbers here for you and uh, what's to come in the near future. So. Uh, 2022, we are tentatively planning to fund nine WRE offers, uh, totaling approximately 530.3 acres. Uh, five of those were from our Vermilion CIS project that was approved in 2021. Those other projects or offers are scattered around the state, uh, Hutchison County, Roberts County, and Tripp counties. Um, those agreements, for the purchase of those conservation easements should be going out here in the next two weeks. So uh, we're still working through a few processes there and getting waiting for the OKs to get them out. Um, and as uh, was noted in the last meeting, um, another change for us over the summer here is that uh, our compatible use authorization timing of hang. Uh, uh, we've been told that that needs to be delayed to match the primary nesting season, so we can no longer or have no longer been starting that uh, July 15th. That's pushed back to August 2nd. Um, looking back on already enrolled easements, uh, whether that be the past year or previous years, uh, We've done some restoration work this summer. Uh, that's still progressing. Uh, we had four easements, uh, approximately totaling 271 acres that were seeded, and uh, five other easements that have seedbed preparation in progress. Uh, and that's both under our federal and uh, various landowner contracts. Um, we are in the process here of getting further contracts lined up as well. So we will be doing more here starting this fall. Um, we had a total of 127 acres that were basically reseeded uh, or some partial reseedings done across 10 easements under our Habitat Forever Cooperative Agreement. Um, and then uh, we, was, we have also had multiple other practices completed uh, this spring and summer. Uh, those include obstruction removals, herbaceous weed control or clippings, and some wetland restorations. Uh, moving on to our water bank program that uh, our easement that does fall under our easement program. Um, we are working on uh, funding 11 of those applications from our 2022 offers, and that totals 
808.3 acres. And last thing, uh, looking forward a little bit is our Wetland Reserve Enhancement Partnership. Uh, those uh, project proposals are due in by September 23rd. Um, I believe that announcement went out about two weeks ago uh, with various information in there on, on what's needed. Uh, there were some attachments and everything else. So uh, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to let me know. Uh, and that's all I have for you today. Great, thank you very much, Marcus. Appreciate the update. Uh, next topic on the agenda would be uh, compliance with EEC. All right. So all this should be in your hand in your handouts. There, it's just our normal compliance workload. I hand out all the time. Um, you can look it over. 569 is about the only thing that's a little different. Seems like we're getting a few more uh, potential violation. Uh, we are investigating this year uh, compared to most other years. Not a lot, but it's definitely noticeable. Oh, your 1026 is that's about on course. I mean, we'll probably land just shy of a thousand. So it's down from kind of the 10 from 2014 all the way through 2019 was 1400. Uh, so we're still getting getting a fair number of them, plenty to keep a person busy. Uh, request age though is nice. I mean, we're sitting there where you know the majority of them are still are in that first month, and then we're getting the rest of them pretty much completed by within four months. The older they get is usually dealing with where we got to go on site and see or evaluate something. Um, highly rotable land. Uh, these evaluations were up to just over 1,500. Uh, 19 outstanding. You know, we got 673 new breakings. We don't track acres on that, just that it's a new breaking. And out of that, there's 164 that were determined highly erodible. That's all I have for that. Uh, any questions whatsoever? All right. Thanks, Brandon. Uh, thank you, Deke. Appreciate the update, sir. Uh, next topic would be partnership reports. Uh, do we have any partners on the call today that would like to uh, come on and provide us an update of what they're doing? So I'll go ahead and, and speak just a moment while people um, get organized. So if you would like to uh, give an up update from your organization, please turn on your cameras. Um, the um, Judge Jessup with the South Dakota Grassland Coalition was unable to uh, be at our meeting today, but he did um, ask if we could give a little update on some of the outreach activities. And it looks like um, it's the Chamberlain Grazing School, which will be held September 13th to 15th. And it's a really great event for producers to, um, to attend, whether you're beginning or seasoned. So just want to put that plug in for the Grassland Coalition. And would there be anybody else that would care to speak? Okay, Cindy, I'll turn it to you. Good morning, everyone. Um, can you hear me? All right, great. Thank you for the opportunity, Brandon and Colette. Um, the Soil Health Coalition has been had a busy year already. Um, we do have some upcoming things, our Soil Health School. It'll be um, coming up here soon. And we also have been doing quite a few different, um, just either um, field tours, and we do have another one um, scheduled in Roberts County that will be coming up in September. We have an events calendar that we keep updated as well as our social media. Um, the staff has been working a lot with producers out in the field and working on conservation implementation through our 319 grant. So we do have funds for cover crop plantings as well as some grazing management um, practice installation as well. So um, one date I want to put on everyone's calendar is our upcoming conference, which is January 24th and 25th, um, and that will be in the Sioux Falls area um next next january it's coming quick so i appreciate the opportunity thanks brandon Clet. thank you cindy appreciate it pete i see your camera's on do you have an update you'd like to talk about 
Yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Okay, I hit the wrong button and totally got myself off the meeting about two seconds ago. So, um, yeah, this is a, I gave this brief update yesterday at the Grassland Coalition meeting, and I hope Jeff Vanderwilt's on, but he might not be. Um, but this is a this is a gift to Jeff that I promise I won't ask him for very much money uh, for the next six months or so, because we've uh, we completed our initial mapping of all of South Dakota now on the on the um, potentially undisturbed mapping project. Um, NRCS has been a huge supporter of that financially and with other resources, including LIDAR, as has Game Fish and Parks, and just a host of other uh, organizations that are on the call today. So I wanted to let you, you let you all know that we've completed the technical part of that, uh, the initial technical part. So all of South Dakota has been now initially mapped, uh, reviewed, and gone through our kind of our vetting process. Um, We'll be working over the next um, several weeks to put out a version of that uh, publicly for you all to use um, in both PDF, JPEG, and uh, uh, shapefile format um, through um, the South Dakota um, Open Prairie, SDSU's Open Prairie site. So uh, please don't inundate me with too many, many requests um, prior to the release of that. But I we did talk yesterday and I think um, I, I obligated us to um, release the information prior to the final report that will actually um, go into much greater depth of describing the information because we're very confident in the coverage. Um, and so what I plan to release uh, when appropriate here, like I said, the next few weeks is that coverage with just a brief, maybe one pager on what it is, how to use it, and there's there's several folks that are recipients of this, but um, I believe uh, NRCS, FSA, and others will then be able to work it right back down their chain to their employees for uh, really immediate use within those GIS systems. Um, going forward, we're still going to be completing uh, the Western South Dakota LIDAR review. I'm not going to go into a ton of detail on that right now, but what that is is a, is a, a second step refinement process that will help us um, just uh, just understand that when we release this, Western South Dakota is going to have still quite a bit of go back land in that layer, and then we'll be working with LIDAR to kind of tease that out over the next several months. But we want to get this initial data out. Uh, the other thing is we've got a grad student working on a change analysis. I get a lot of requests, um, folks wanting to know how much grasslands do we will have we lost or will we lose or what's the projection. And so the the question we'll be able to actually answer probably for the first time ever is a pretty good indication of what we've lost for native grasslands over the last 10 or 12 years. What we won't be able to answer with any confidence is what type of loss of total grasslands as far as conversions of CRP and other uh, other previously cropped land. Um, so I just want to clarify that. And, and for those of you that don't understand what I'm talking about. It'll be it'll become clear in these reports and stuff. So, um, was there one more thing I don't recall? Colette, was there one more piece of that that we had talked about yesterday that I'm? No, that sounds great, Pete. And, and actually, was... um, hopefully, if your schedule allows, maybe we could uh, preview the report. Maybe the uh, state technical committee meeting coming up if when it's released. And, and fully accessible, then if you wouldn't mind, we could maybe have that as a future topic. I think we should plan. So do we know, do you know generally when the next state tech is see it's August? So the next one will be December, mid December, right? Uh, November or December. I think Kathy will have those, those, that information and we can get it to you. Yeah. And yeah. if that would happen to conflict, we could do it at the, at the second quarter. Yeah, I think we could try. I think we should definitely plan on the next one and um, and we can deal with the details going forward. Um, so anyway, a big, a, a humongous thank you to these all the organizations that are on the phone today that have supported this in any way, uh, even with just letters of support for grants um, and other things. It's been a it has truly been a multi multi partner effort. And it will continue to be, but um, we're really happy. Oh, the final piece of this—I forgot. This is the this is the good part. Um, 
when this all comes to fruition, we're working with Game Fish and Parks as a place to house this information for professional and public access over time and space to continually work on the data set. I'm not going to go into a lot more detail on that now because there's still some things that we're, we're working out. But again, um, amazing step up from partners on this to um, take this data. If it stays at SDSU, it will probably be less and less accessible over time. And we wanted to put it in a place that really has a living public access type of um, of uh, GIS footprint in South Dakota. So Game Fish and Parks has agreed to explore that with us. So uh, many thanks to them. That's it. All right, thank you very much, Pete. Appreciate that great update. And we look forward to uh, seeing that product here in the future. Uh, and, and to answer your question is we are currently looking at about November-ish uh, for the next date take meeting, but we'll definitely update as we go so um next on the list looks like uh bruce got an update please hey good morning everybody uh bruce toy with with ducks unlimited here just thought i'd provide a, a little more update uh Krisha mentioned our rcpp project earlier that's uh, been uh, uh much of our focus here over the last few months uh at our last meeting i mentioned we having a we had a sign up uh period here in, in mid-june and collected about uh, 15 applications here across uh, eastern and South Dakota uh, that that screen high and were, were eligible for funding. So uh, our staff spent a bunch of time over that period meeting with these producers and and uh, putting together uh, you know potential plans to get in the field for those projects. Uh, we set up a, a ranking criteria uh, to kind of score each of these applications. Uh, um, you know, really uh, honing in on on what's important to, you know for producers and for for wetlands and for and for wildlife, so focusing on areas with high wetland densities and, and grass restoration and, and soil health principles uh, and that sort of thing. So, uh, in in that process, we had five applications that really uh, floated to the top, you know, based on those scores and really checked all of those boxes. Um, all of those, uh, you know, improving soil health on croplands by by reducing tillage and and incorporating cover crops and increasing crop diversity. I think all of them had a significant grass restoration component, uh, and all of them had uh, grazing infrastructure uh, needs on on cropland and and grassland grazing systems. So really, really checking all of our boxes, and and those are the five we we've, we've decided to uh, you know, move forward with in this in this first funding cycle. Uh, looking at a footprint of right around six thousand acres uh, with those applications, and looking to spend the, our our initial guesstimates here right around that. $800,000 range for, for our first sign up. No. So with that being said, you know, over the next few months, uh, this is a, a new process. So just kind of figuring out how these RCPP agreements are going to look like uh, through the alternative funding arrangement, uh, getting those agreements put together and hope to have uh, practices being delivered here in the spring of 2023. Um, so then also through that process, uh, um, hoping to have another sign up here, uh, probably late winter, um, to get uh, more producers in the door and, and start looking at the at the next phase, if you will. Um, but if anybody has any questions on that, feel feel free to reach out to me. But thanks for the time this morning. Thank you, Bruce. Appreciate the update. Uh, do we have any other partners that that would like to come this morning? All right, Tony. Go ahead, yeah. sir. Good morning, everyone. Tony Life, South Dakota Agricultural Land Trust here. Uh, just give a brief update. Uh, Krisha um, did mention the great news that we learned of within the last few days uh, about being awarded an RCPP grant. We're really excited about uh, working with NRCS on that. Um, of course, NRCS has been a key partner of ours all along the way since we uh, formed just three years ago. Um, and we're excited to, to get to work with them on that. Uh, we did accept our first easement earlier this year, uh, back in March of 762 acres of grass and forest uh, rangeland that's located just outside of uh, Spearfish, South Dakota. I do have an additional two easements uh, where the landowners are, are uh, committed to donating those easements uh, to the trust. Uh, one of those in Custer County and the other one in Brule County. Also have uh, an, a couple other possible 
uh, donated easements that we're working on, uh, but we're not uh, actively engaged in in uh, putting the the uh, due diligence work together for those just yet. Um, as uh, mentioned before, and Krisha mentioned that uh, RCPP uh, funding that we received uh, will be for easements in the Black Hills. And as she mentioned, uh, those of you that have lived in that area, or visited Black Hills, realize the accelerated rate of exurban growth that's occurring within the Black Hills. And we're excited to maybe to help a couple landowners uh, maybe work on putting those easements on that property. Uh, look forward to working with NRCS to put that programmatic partnership agreement together. Uh, and that's something that will um, become a priority of mine to make sure that we uh, step through all the proper channels to ensure that uh, uh, we can funnel those dollars uh, out to uh, producers in our state. Lastly, um, our first newsletter uh, that was just published within the last month uh, was pretty widely distributed. Uh, hopefully all of you on the call uh, saw a copy of that. Um, if you didn't, please shoot me a note and I can sure get a copy of that out to you. It's, it's an electronic distribution that we're using uh, to get that out. Um, lastly, thanks again to NRCS for, for the funding commitment that we received with uh, in the past and this new funding. Uh, we're hoping to also see some favorable news eventually on the ASEP ale the agricultural land easement program we do have a couple producers uh, that we submitted applications for with that and hoping for some favorable news on on that uh, funding front here someday also so with that i appreciate some some of your time this morning and uh, thank you all for the partnerships that we do have in south dakota Thank you very much, Tony, for that update. Any other uh, partners out there have a topic they'd like to discuss this morning? All right, I'm not seeing anyone come online here. Um, so I guess that kind of brings us to the end here. I guess I, I'd ask if there's any other questions that anyone has at this time or any other Three topics you'd like to discuss. Okay, well, I'm not seeing too much in the in the chat. Um, thank you for all the presenters today um, and going over your respective topics. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, everyone else, for your time um, and participation in today's state technical committee meeting and. As we get the next date set, we'll be sure to get it out to give you all advance notice on when that's going to be. But like I said earlier, we're looking at November at this time. So I guess with that, again, thank you all. Um, and if you have any further questions, don't be afraid to shoot me an email or give me a call. So have a great day, everybody.